This session is to follow up on what we did last lecture, uh, looking at soil water retention. So we, we went a little bit further than I thought we would go then. Uh, we're just going to go back and maybe fill in some of the gaps. So last lecture, we discovered that uh, soil water content and what we are calling soil water potential, and we'll unpack that a little bit more today, are closely related. Um, but there are some key things that we need to remember. First of all, the smaller the pore in a soil, uh, the stronger, more strongly, or the greater the force with which it holds water. Uh, so we introduced at least the concept of soil water potential or matrix potential, which is the, in simplistic terms, the pressure that you need to empty a soil pore. And in fact, that's how we do it experimentally in your practical classes. We actually apply pressure to dry soil to a certain uh, matrix potential, and we do that at a number of pressures. So the smaller the pore, the higher the pressure needed to empty it. And there were two critical water contents related to two values of potential. There was field capacity, which is where the soil drains to under gravity, and we assign a value of minus 10 kilopascals of matrix potential to field capacity. And then we also use the concept of a wilting point for plants, so a, a point at which the osmotic potential that plants can exert on soil water is not strong enough to extract it from the soil anymore. And for crop plants, that's at minus 1500 kilopascals, but maybe a little bit higher for species that are adapted to dry conditions. And we touched on this idea about hysteresis and soil water retention curves looking different for wetting and drying and how that was related to the geometry along a pore system. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to revisit soil water potentials in terms of the balance of forces acting on soil water. Uh, we'll talk about potentials in soil water retention and have a little preview of water dynamics, which is really the next lecture that I'll give you. Uh, and so by the end of this lecture, this is really a summary of the last two lectures. Uh, you'll know about those potentials. You'll understand the relationship between soil pore radius and water potential. And remember that we have a little equation for that too, which we'll look at in labs. We use a, and this is what we did last time, we used a simple model of the soil as just a collection of thin tubes to explain soil water retention, and that's not a bad model. We'll revisit that again today. Um, already mentioned field capacity and permanent wilting point, but there are specific ways in which we use those, and we can revisit those. Uh, we looked at an example. Uh, and the whole thing gets us towards explaining and interpreting soil water retention curves. So let's see if we can have a go at that. Some reading, good reading in White uh, and McKenzie et al. Uh, and if you want to, all of these are available as ebooks through the UWA library. Uh, Daniel Hillel's book on soil in, in the environment has some good basic treatment of soil water retention as well. So here's the thought. The concept of soil water potential water will move from high to low potential. The most simple and obvious example of that is water that flows downhill. So it flows from high gravitational potential, which an elevated body would have, to a lower one, to presumably some reference point, which might be sea level or something like that. Now, water in soil doesn't always move downwards, it may move upwards sometimes, it may move sideways, and that's because there are other potentials acting on soil water. So water in soil will move to minimise its total potential, not just gravitational potential. So here's a few that we need to consider, and these are the ones, the only ones that we'll consider in this lecture. So gravitational potential is important. Uh, it's important in certain situations in soils, particularly when the water content is above the field capacity water content. For example, a soil that's very saturated with water can lose water by gravity, meaning that water is moving from an area of high gravitational potential to lower. Uh, 
Matrix potential is what we dealt with last lecture. So it really relates to the tendency of pores to fill with water. And the smaller the pore, the higher that tendency is. So that's related to the phenomenon of capillarity. Pressure potential really only exists in soils where we have water sitting above a soil. So a flooded soil, for example, um, and some types of irrigation may uh, involve that type of process or just natural flooding. And finally, we need to consider solute or osmotic or even sometimes called salt potential. Uh, water will lower its potential by diluting a solution. Okay, So a concentrated solution has a higher water potential or phi s than a dilute solution one that's so saltier water has a higher potential than fresher and remember that potential is always denoted by this greek symbol phi and the subscripts tell us about which type of potential we're talking about the one we mostly consider is matrix potential phi m Okay, a little note for me and for you, uh, that pressure potential in unsaturated soil will be zero. So unless there's water sitting above the surface of the soil, then there is no pressure potential. Okay, so let's unpack those one by one as we go. So gravitational potential, as we mentioned, only works on soils above field capacity, and it's able to empty pores which are held with a matrix potential of minus 10 kilopascals or greater so say between saturation and minus 10 kilopascals so gravitational potential allows that water to drain from the soil and gives us a soil at field capacity right can't go any further because the remainder of the water in a soil would be held at matrix potentials which can overcome gravitational potential or they're larger. So gravitational potential allows leaching from soil above field capacity. It doesn't need to be saturated, it just needs to be above the field capacity for that particular soil. Okay, here's another way of looking at that. A saturated soil has pores which are completely full of water. So what we call gravitational water is lost, and that results in a soil which is at field capacity. So in this case, the water is moving from high gravitational potential to lower. So the lowest possible point for water, which in a soil probably isn't the ocean, it's probably the groundwater, uh, it has the lowest potential in that part of the system. Right? So field capacity is the upper limit of available water for plant growth. And plants can then extract or water loss can happen by other ways. Um, but plants can't extract it if the water content is equivalent to the wilting point. So our matrix potential is minus 1500 kilopascals. Water is only resident in very small pores. We know that they're about 0.1 microns in diameter at, field, at uh, permanent wilting point. And um, so it's between these two thresholds, field capacity and wilting point, that water is available to plants. Okay, matrix potential we're going to revise right now. So we know that smaller pores exert a more negative matrix potential. That means water will preferentially occupy those small pores. So at, at equilibrium, uh, at any given water content, it will be the pores are full of water from the smallest up to the largest, right? And the largest that can be occupied at any given water content. So diagrammatically, the small pores attract water first because water minimizes its potential to a lower value by going into a smaller pore compared with a larger larger pore. So the order of filling is from small to large. If we think about the grains in a soil, which schematically might look something like that or not, um, 
initial water addition to the soil, once it equilibrates with the soil, will end up in the very small pores. And I've tried to indicate in that in this diagram. So the largest spaces in between soil grains or aggregates are not occupied by water, whereas the small pores are. Okay, pressure potential. Remember, pressure potential only exists where we have water standing above the soil surface and pressure potential. So the height of that water exerts a pressure uh, and it's related to gravitational potential. So water would then, uh, the process is called infiltration. Okay, so phi P or pressure potential only exists on a flooded soil and the consequence of having a pressure potential is infiltration from above the soil into the soil. Now we need to talk about that a bit later on when we talk about movement of water in soils because obviously infiltration is one of the initial parts of water movement in soils. It's what the entry flux of water into the soil system in many cases. So osmotic potential, just shown in, in diagrammatic form here, Hopefully you can see this with sufficient resolution on your screen. We've got little dots inside the soil here, which are supposed to represent a low salt concentration compared with the large dots here. And the tendency is for water to move in the direction of the more concentrated solution. And that's because there is a... If water wants to minimize this potential, it will try to dilute the solution, right? So maybe a little bit tricky to get your head around, but water will preferentially move into the more salty soil in an effort to reduce the potential of the water in that soil environment, which has got a higher salt concentration. Okay, That's one of the reasons why plants find it difficult to extract water from salty soils. It's not just the damage to their root systems, but because of the osmotic potential um, exerted um, by the tendency of water to move into that salty soil rather than away from that salty soil into roots. Okay, so total water, soil water potential, so phi T, um, is the sum of all of those potentials. And if the soil is at a true hydraulic equilibrium, that is, it's in equilibrium with the water that's in the soil, then the total soil water potential is at a minimum. Now, often that's dominated by matrix potential, but not, not always. Okay. However, hydraulic equilibrium almost never occurs because water is always moving in and out of soils. Water keeps moving. So there are inputs from rainfall or irrigation or movement sideways of groundwater. Uh, and there are outputs of water from the soil, mainly uh, evapotranspiration uh, and evaporation under drier conditions, but under much wetter soil conditions, obviously leaching through the soil uh, and out of the soil volume into groundwater, for instance. Okay, I'll just... In case you are taking notes on this, those are the types of pressure that we need to consider in soils. So you might like to think about what some of the outputs and inputs of water are. I've mentioned a few of them, uh, but there are more, and uh, particularly the inputs of water to soils, uh, we need to think about those and what the total water balance looks like. Uh, that can be extremely important when we're considering not just the amount of water that's able to be stored in the soil, uh, and uh, but also phenomena like soil erosion and things like that. Okay, so here's not a bad summary diagram, uh, and it shows the two critical water contents, the wilting point, which obviously is a lower co water content than field capacity, as a function of soil texture going from coarser material such as a sand through sandy loam loam to a fine material a clay so a clay soil is the the finest texture class that we usually consider all right and we can see that for example the 
field capacity water content for pure sand is actually quite low, somewhere probably around 5% by volume, very low. Um, for a more uh, sandy soil or loamy sand or sandy loam, it may be up around 10%, but it's still quite a small volume of water in the sand. Uh, and in a clay soil, the field capacity is at much higher water content, maybe about 35%, but has correspondingly much higher water capacity at wilting. So there's quite a lot of water in a clay soil that's completely unavailable to plants, whether they're crops or plants in a native ecosystem. And there's a at least theoretical progression down the, the texture sequence through to a coarser material again, uh, which looks something like that, and field capacity um, reaches some sort of maximum, and that's usually related to the uh, total porosity being finite. Okay, so field capacity, for example, in a clay or other heavier textured soil, uh, it may be that um, nearly all of the pores are able to hold water against gravity. So the field capacity in clays and clay loams are quite high. So here's a few questions for you to consider. So first of all, why do we think the wilting point is lower for a sand than for a clay? So you have a think about that for a minute. I'll come up with an answer. So what we, what we do try to express this in is the, uh, the the pore sizes that are available in the soil. Okay, so a sand has very few pores that are less than one micron in size, just because of the size of the individual sand grains and the unlikely uh, um, incidence of soil structure in a sand. So we have relatively large pores with very, very small fraction of very fine pores, maybe where sand grains are, are touching like that. And right in the corner um, of the grains touching, we find a very small pore space. It's all just water adhering to the sand grains uh, by a different mechanism. So the, the wilting point, um, meaning pores less than minus 0.1 microns in size, is a very small volume of a sandy soil, whereas it's quite a large volume of a clay soil. So remember that clay particles are only two microns in size or less. So the, the spaces in between them can be extremely small. And so a clay soil can have quite a large volume of its total pore volume in pore sizes less than that 0.1 micron threshold. All right. What soil texture has the greatest available water? So a little bit counterintuitively, it's not the clay. Um, so it's where there's the greatest difference between the wilting point, or called in this diagram, wilting coefficient, means the same as permanent wilting point, and field capacity. And we can see on this diagram, if you measure the vertical distance between those two lines and the, the dark blue, well, mid-blue section here, it's probably a, a soil like a silt loam. So that would be larger than the soils, the loam or the clay loam either side. Uh, and so it has a lot of its uh, pore sizes, a lot of a high volume of pore sizes in the range 0.1 to about 15 microns in size. So between field capacity and the permanent wilting point for crop plants. All right. Why is the field capacity lower for a sandy loam than for a clay? That's really the same question as we asked before. Um, so a clay has a certain proportion of its pore size between 15 microns and 0.1 microns. Sandy loam has a little bit less. In fact, it's, it's not as much less as you think it might be. And why is the available water lower for a clay loam than for a silt loam? I think we, we dealt with that idea when we talked about soil texture. But that, those are the typical questions that we might ask about available water in soils as a function of texture. And it would be really useful for you to understand those.
Remember that the main control on the shape of the soil water retention curve is texture. So even though there are the other potentials in soils which are acting on soil water and uh, the water in soils needs to come into equilibrium with gravitational potential and osmotic potential and pressure potential as well as matrix potential, um, these are the ones that we can, uh, the matrix potential is governed by texture is, is probably the dominant factor. Uh, also structure as well. So we, we would see, for example, quite a difference in water retention curve between a clay and a, which is structured and a clay which is not structured. So just to revise the soil water retention curve one more time. Um, so what we're looking at here is the water content on a volumetric basis, theta V plotted against the matrix potentials. We haven't put the symbol phi M on there, but you get the idea in kilopascals uh, in this case for a range of soils of different textures. If we just look at the black line, which is at bottom left, just highlighting it with the mouse at the moment, we see that the water content at saturation or near enough for a sand is a similar value to other soils. But as we increase pressure applied experimentally, or uh, as we, we note that at a matrix potential of minus 10 kilopascals, which is our field capacity, then a sandy soil has much less water in it than the other soils. And that's because it doesn't have a whole lot of pores which are less than 15 microns in size. Okay, The large size of the sand grains means that a lot of the pores are larger than 15 microns and so it can't hold water at a potential of less than, uh, much water at a potential of, uh, sorry, greater than minus 10 kilopascals. And the greater than is down this end. Freaky. All right. And then a sand will drop down again quite quickly to um, the permanent wilting point. So the available water between permanent wilting point and field capacity for this example of a sand is about um, 0.1 or 10%. Okay. These are fractional values rather than being percentages. So 0 to 40% water content. Contrast that with the clay, which uh, doesn't change much in water content even though the uh, pressure that might be applied to empty pores moves from saturation through to 100 kilopascals, that's because it doesn't have a whole lot of larger pores in a clay soil. It does have a lot of fine pores, and they're the ones that are holding on to water even at matrix potentials uh, more negative than minus 10,000 kilopascals. Um, and the field capacity is actually, in this example, similar to a sand. Uh, so between the water content between these two thresholds, let's just draw a line to make that really obvious. Okay, so for a clay, not the best line in the known universe, but you get the idea. Okay, so here's the available water content for our clay soil. And for our sandy soil, actually this diagram is showing it higher. So I'd argue that that clay curve above represents a fairly unstructured clay. It doesn't have a lot of large pores in it. All right. So I think once you revise the material from both lectures, you, you'll have a pretty good handle on how to interpret soil water retention curves. Uh, just remember that we can always directly relate the matrix potential. So the force with which a soil pore holds water to the pore size. Okay. So if there's a large decrease in water content between minus one kilopascals and minus 10 kilopascals, we know that there's a lot of porosity between, in this case, uh, 15 and 150 microns in size.
so that finishes our discussion of soil water retention and you've got a good grasp hopefully now of soil water potentials let's just take a little look at where we're going to be headed for the next lecture and then we'll leave it there okay so we're going to look at dynamics meaning the movement of water in soils um, and cover a bunch of things and one of the things we're going to have a look at is sort of hydrology okay the idea of a soil water balance okay um, meaning that we can account for the water present in a soil if we know all of the inputs and here's a few of them precipitation what we call canopy drip which is an indirect form of, of precipitation as a stem flow we would also need to consider um, irrigation as being another input and so on and we also need to consider the losses um, notice that we've got, got runoff here as well so runoff from one part of the landscape to another can be a water input as well and the outputs include uh, deep, what we call deep percolation or leaching um, but also uptake by the plant and transpiration as part of the photosynthetic process and bare soil evaporation and also loss of what is called in this diagram interflow or sometimes called lateral flow so this is taken from an earlier version of uh, bob white's textbook the one that's available as an ebook is the 2006 version this may have an even better version of this particular diagram but right now we are going to leave it there and hopefully i'll see you in person for the next lecture thanks very much Thank <music> you.